So, and um, this today is Becky Meyer, and we've had her um, present with us before, and she just did a wonderful job of history and information and all of that. And so she's going to tell us a little bit about herself and a little bit about what she is doing now. And of course, the main deal is she's going to talk a little bit about the Hopi um, Kachina and jewelry making. So I think that's it. Thank you for coming. A small but appreciative crowd. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> Southwest with the Native Americans. Today it's going to be on jewelry and kachinas. Sorry. And so um, what I'd like to do is my background is in archaeology and it's also in art history. And I've taught art history and humanities for the last um, 16, 20 years. I'm retired from that now. But before that, um, way long time ago, I was a, I was a um, an archaeologist, and my master's degree, my graduate degree, is in Native American art history, and I wanted to know where it all came from. So then I immediately um, took um, got a job as a state archaeologist in Arizona and did archaeology down there. And so that's where I, I traveled to the Hopi Mesas and the Navajo Reservation. And so that's, that's what I'll be telling you today, giving you information about today. Um, I realize it was uh, a while ago. I don't feel like it is, but I, I understand it was a while ago that I did this. But guess what? Nothing has really changed, which is good. <coughs> in one sense and bad in another. Um, there have been some changes, but um, the, what I'm going to tell you is basically the same as it was many, many years ago. Okay? So if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to ask, and I'd appreciate that. Okay? I gave you out a sheet, and I, I see I need to give out a couple more sheets here. Um, of the vocabulary related to jewelry and kachinas. And, um, uh, oh, they're over here. Where are you? Oh, there you are. Oh, there you are. <laughs> here he is. Thank you. And I probably should explain to you guys. It's got um, stuff on the back. I should probably explain to all of you that don't know me, I am visually impaired. So, um, and it was because of archaeology that I am visually impaired. And someday I can go in and tell you all about that if you want, if you're interested. But it um, has to do with valley fever. And so, um, and I'm fine now, everything's a okay. But I don't have vision in my right eye, and I have limited vision in my left eye, and then I'm getting old. <laughs> so guess <Yeah>. what? <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. And I'm sure a lot of you can. Yes. If you can't, you will. Yes. <laughs> right? So um, what I'm going to do is start with jewelry. And um, this is basically <coughs> the vocabulary I'm, I'm going to be rattling off as I talk. And so you have this on your sheet. Um, lapidaries are stone, um, uh, people who work with stone and re chiseling and resizing stones. Um, and so then you get the cutting, the polishing, the engraving, the um, of precious and non precious stones. And so we'll, I'll be referring to that every once in a while. It's interesting that some tribes in the Southwest did not get involved in lapidary at all. So, um, and then we're going to talk about chasing and soldering. And chasing is when, um, and I'll go into this when I, when I talk about 
since I come from a historical perspective, I will be giving you um, the history and the development of the jewelry and the kachina making in the Southwest. So um, I will be talking a lot about chasing. Um, as far, I don't even think I have slides. It's very rare now, but the chasing is when the um, Navajo uh, silversmith would just get his pen knife out with the sharp point and just dig into the metal. The, the silver sheet metal, and that's what chasing is. And then um, soldering, you all know what that is. Dyes is, I'm going to uh, refer to that possibly, but it's a steel block or plate with a um, conical hole through which you pull the wire through, and that's what gives you your tubes. And that uh, was done manually by the Navajo and by the Indians of the Southwest. But now, of course, they um, will all go into this, but they don't even hardly do it anymore, unless that is their purpose, to redo the original way. Okay, so you have the die, which has different sized and different shaped holes that you pull the wire through, and that um, is the um, dimension and the shape of your tube or your wire. And, um, I know about dyes because I use them when I do ceramics. You pull the clay through and you make different shapes. Okay? So, um, and then engraved, they, another uh, part of dyes is engraved or stamped impressions on the design. You will see a lot of that today. We're going to talk about squash blossom, najas, I'll point out what those are, conches, I'll point out what those are, hallmark bezel and he she okay and um and then the bowl so i will go over all this you don't have to panic here although you are going to have a quiz at the end <laughs> so i expect you to all get a hundred <laughs> i.e you're listening right <laughs> okay so we're going to start of course with the prehistoric oh prehistoric is so exciting because <laughs> it's with the hobo con in arizona that we get such really cool Indian jewelry. Look at that! It's shell. And now we see prehistoric, this is before, prehistoric just means before the written record, we see the beginning of inlay or mosaic work. They're taking turquoise and they're placing it in a, a gum background, natural gum background, and on the shell bracelet. Where do they get the shell? Great. 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 What we're going to see with the um, jewelry does come from Mexico, mm -hmm. the influence. Okay? So, very good. So here's this real sexy shot, I thought, mm -hmm. of the um, Hohokan uh, bracelets, prehistoric. And now we're going to jump right into the Navajo. Um, whoops. We're going to uh, start with this. Mm -hmm. This is a a very early piece of Navajo jewelry, and I will talk about Old Pond in just a minute. But the Navajos and the Native Americans of the Southwest were very interested in the cross symbol. Okay? They may or may not have been Christians, but why would they be interested in the cross? Try to think of, in, well, a lot of you didn't come to weaving, but we saw a lot of um, crosses and what we would call, you just glancing at it, you would call it swastikas. But they're not, they're reversed from the Germans. Mm -hmm. what, what does that mean? Water. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Water, fire, earth and air. Wind, mm -hmm. fire. Mm -hmm. You know, the group. Earth, wind, and fire. Come yeah. on. Come on, get with me, man. So, um, yes, yeah, so they were very interested in that shape. And so they, um, they started their early work 
by doing uh, the cross. <coughs> Here is an early um, Navajo woman, and it's probably a Nivor Curtis photograph, but I, show, I brought it in to show you what um, the jewelry she's wearing. So this is at the late 1800s and the turn of the century. So here she has the squash blossom. The squash blossoms are plants. So these little things sticking out the side here, those are the little budding flowers. That's what a squash blossom is. This, the horseshoe shaped form down here was derived from the Spanish and that is the nausea. So when I refer to squash blossom and nausea, then you'll know what that is. Here's a man, I'm sure you've all seen this picture. He has um, the, um, uh, Edward Curtis's shot of a Navajo medicine man, and this is, um, um, he's got the jewelry on, so I just thought I'd show you how early it's starting. Okay, where did the Navajo learn jewelry making, and did it just come all of a sudden? Well, the Navajo learned uh, jewelry making from the Spanish. The 1540s, the Spanish came, and that's when the um, Navajos, who came from the north, remember, they came from the northwest. They're at the basket speakers with the Apache, and so they came from the northwest coast. Of our United States today and migrated down and then um, so they're at the Baskin speakers and then the Spaniards came in and they uh, were influenced by the Spaniards so what they did is they took um, all the tools they took the methods the manual methods by hand of making the jewelry and also the coins. And this is what the Native Americans made their jewelry from in the beginning, was the Spanish-Mexican coins. Okay? So, so here we have what I would call, if I saw this, like at, um, there's a gallery in Santa Fe that has great old pawn. Okay? So this is Old Pond, and we have squash blossom necklaces with the nausea at the end. Where they got the nausea is, okay, what does it kind of look like? It's a Muslim, isn't it? Is it from the Moors? I'm going to point to you. What does it look like? Horseshoe. Yeah. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Looks like a horseshoe. That's exactly what they took for inspiration, and it was from the Spanish and the Mexicans. Okay. But it's very similar to designs in other cultures very similar to the Kelpie. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You're going to see all this. You're going to go ding, 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 ding. Celtic, uh, everything. You're just going to go bing, bing, bing. Yeah. Okay. So, um, but I look at this, I think, ah, old pawn. What's pawn? Yes, you guys all know. This is all for money. You, mm -hmm. Yeah, you guys all know. Right. You know what pawn shop is. Yeah. That's what it is. The Native Americans took their jewelry in because they had to pay. It was the only thing they had to pay for their credit, for their food that they got from the trading post. So they take jewelry in and leave it. And then if they didn't come back in two or three weeks' time for the pawn, you know, to collect their pawn, then it would become quote-unquote dead pawn. And then the trading post owner could sell it. But we have a lot of that coming down was never sold. And you'll get so you'll be able to notice it. You'll be able to pick it out. It's not shiny. It's not polished. It doesn't look brand new. You're going to say, oh, that's old. And, and just the way it's made. But that's what old pawn is. Also, the Navajos were really influenced by the Spaniards um, with the horse. You know that the Spaniards brought what? Horses, guns. Christianity. Right. So um, they brought all this. So the horses, this is a Navajo bridle to go on to the horse. And so they, the very early Navajo work was with making horse 
um, bridles. But you can see they've uh, included the nausea form there. Okay, here's a Navajo man displaying his jewelry. Okay, so here he's like, here I am. And this is, um, this, these are, this is a concha belt. Big conchas. Okay, big. And a concha belt, you would say, oh, I've seen all those, see those all the time, ranchers wear them. And it's just a leather belt with the silver oval discs all the way around. Those are conches. Here's the concha belt. And this is conches. These are um, conches right here. And then these are butterflies, quote unquote butterflies. Now, how are these made? They're pressed into the metal. They get the sheet metal, the silver, the sheet of the silver, and they press it with their tools, and then they stamp it. And so they're using old stamps to go around the outside. It's probably a half-shape metal thing that just looks like that. And then they take, put that down, and then take a knife. I mean a hammer and just pounce it really hard. And so they repeat the shapes all the way around. And then this is repoussé, which means they push from the back. And um, so that's how they made these. Here you see a Navajo woman, a current day Navajo woman, but look at her, um, look at her, uh, or her arms and her collar. Those are dimes. That's the coins. Mm -hmm. They would use the coins and um, in the beginning and decorate all their clothing and everything. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's stop right here because this is where I get anthropological, sociological on you. <laughs> okay? Why, why are we interested? Why are the Navajos interested in um, jewelry and interested in uh, the silver? or the silversmith. Are they going to make a thousand dollars? Probably not. This is, we're talking late 1800s, 1700s. They trade with it. Um, they see, trade with it? As they trade, they could trade. Okay, good. Status and wealth. Status. That's it. What is it? It's Status the same as today. Status. As status and wealth, okay? And the more, and, and you And see, love of beauty. Exactly. <laughs> You're taking it all well. You know, I want to teach you something. But yes, because the more they have on their arms and around their neck, the more you know I'm wealthy, okay? We know it. We know it. I don't see... Unfortunately, I don't see anybody of color here. What do us gringos like to do? Wear our jewelries, wear our squash blossoms, wear our diamonds, because we want you to know that we have importance and wealth. It's the same. It's a fashion statement. But mine's appreciation. Hmm? Mine's more appreciation. Right. Yeah. Oh, I know. Yeah. I am too. But, but you know what I mean when you know some of these people, like, oh, I, I travel, I've traveled all around the world, and I, I went with these people of all places. We went to Egypt, and we're, uh, we're going along, and they have to stop at every jewelry store. I'm like, why? We're in Egypt. This is the epitome of, you know, civilization. This is, you know, I could go on and on. No, I want to go. I want the, they sound really cool. I want to get, I want to go. Right? One right. of my cutest stories about the store was a lady who came in and had beautiful jewelry on. And she told me, honey, I moved to Santa Fe from Texas. And you know why? Because in Santa Fe, I can wear it by the pound right. instead of by the piece. Right. <laughs> exactly. That's what I'm talking about. Well, the Navajos were like that, too. It was a way of showing their wealth. And they may have received it in trade. That makes them even more wealthy. And so it's, it's really important. 
that way. I brought these in because, of course, you don't you don't know this, but um, I'm I like the simple. I'm I'm simple, and so these are what's called Navajo pearls, and I just think they're lovely, and they're made. Um, they're made um, in a conical, in a cylindrical shape, and then strung on beads. Now, a quick note here. The Navajos made these. You saw them on the uh, original old squash blossom necklace. They made those by hand. And all they did was just take their little needle-nose plier and crimp, 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 crimp. And then they file, 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 and then they sand, 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 you know. But now what do they do? Moles. Moles. Yeah, and, and, and you can, what they do, what they're doing now, is some of them will be made by hand. You always have to, add, I'm going to give you a lot of consumer information. A lot of them are made by hand, but you have to ask, did you make these? And, and they start stalling and they say, well, 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 well I strung them. Well, did you make these beads? Whoa, 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 whoa. Because they can get beads from China. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? They can get beads, and it's cheaper, and it's faster, and then they can um, sell it to you. So you have to be really discerning when you buy turquoise or any of these like beaded pearl necklaces that you see with the Navajo. And it's not like they're trying to swindle you. It's just, this is, this is consistency, <coughs> right? Yeah, are, are those beads solid? These are, um, these are not. Yeah. Okay. So they're, okay. they're hammered okay. and bent and polished. Okay, okay so here is um, later, yeah, um, right. as we go through the periods into the latter uh, <coughs> half of the uh, 20th century, and. The, this, we're going to start showing you uh, jewelry that you're going to recognize now. Mm -hmm. And this is called chunk jewelry. Okay? So I have a story about this. This is just Raya. So I see my aunt, who, who was um, you know, on <coughs> my side of the family, and was relatively well-to-do. And so she was sitting in her vanity, and she had a big necklace like this on, and the discs on the chunk, oh my god. They were this big, and but they were thin, you know, like this. And so I said, God, really, that is a beautiful necklace. <coughs> Do you know what she said? She said, well, I, I guess so. That's what people tell me. And I let the grandbaby play with it. <laughs> bang, bang, bang on the your high chair tray, you know. And I'm like, oh. So even she didn't even know what she had. <coughs> and so that's very valuable right now. And this is all um, turquoise. Now, the Navajos weren't work lapidaries. They weren't interested in working with stone. You'll find that that originated and got very popular with the Zuni. And I will show you that with working with stone. And here we are. Now, I don't, I don't recognize too many from the last time I spoke, but how do we know this is, these are Zuni women? By the pots on their head. And that's the way they used to carry them, to carry water. They'd go down to the brick and put, put it in their pot, a clay pot, and carry it on their head back to the, um, to the Pueblo. Okay? So I just thought I'd show you what a traditional Zuni woman looked like. And this is what the Zuni make. And today I'm going to be showing you primarily Zuni jewelry. Because you're going to recognize it. You're going to say, oh man, I've seen that, seen that, seen that, been to Santa Fe, seen that, seen that. Oh, do you have a bunch of this stuff? I, I don't. I, I wore it. And so I will talk about my earrings. <laughs> no, I don't. Okay, so this is um, the inlay and the mosaic technique. Okay, and you will see that they've um, done geometric shapes, but they also have a mask. They also have a, a bug, which looks like a butterfly, and um, the sun symbol. It's 
So they're putting a lot of symbols. And some of them are, um, oh, I've seen some of them used in, like, in the center. That's like a flask, a little flask that we carry. Some are used for snuff, even, and um, are just uh, decorated on, in a shell pattern on, um, on a necklace. Okay? So the way these are made are the way my earrings are made. You have the um, stones, and they're all cut, and they're set onto the metal, and then they're they're joined together, and in between them is a very thin, thin, thin piece of silver that's soldered, and then they inlay the stone, and then um, you get the mosaic. But they're stunning. Can I ask you what the top three symbol is? It looks like a chalice, and the top three. Um, was it, do you know what that symbol is? I don't. I was I was going to try to find the um, sun symbol for you. I see. Well, I see the sun. Stand here. On the right. Yes. The sun. Yeah. But um, I don't because I don't see a chalice. <laughs> it's the big one up to the, the right. The big three. The three at the top. The blue. Yeah. yeah. That has a blue. Oh, oh, yeah. oh! I see how you see a chalice. Yeah. yeah. I I think it's just a design. Yeah. Oops. Now, the Zuni also <coughs> developed the um, petty point and the needle point. And I'm showing you all this because you'll still see it today. Okay? And this was developed after the uh, 1940s and um, tried to, uh, uh, same with pottery. Of the designs on the pots. Why do we make our pots just to carry gruel and water? Why do we make, put all those beautiful designs on it? Basically, um, to enhance and to uh, compete with the other tribes and the other person that's making the jewelry. Okay? So here we have, right here on the right is called Petty Point, and then on the left here, is called needlepoint. Needlepoint has a rounded end on one end, one side of the stone, mm -hmm. and then a point at the other, and then the petty point has mm -hmm. two points on it on either end. And you'll see that we're going to get into discussing row work. It means the stones are set all in a row constantly, mm -hmm. but it's made to just form this geometric concentric circle. The, the Native American, you know, the symbol of the circle is very important to the Native American. It's birth and death, recycling, regeneration, going through the life, and everything is constantly moving and dynamic. And so they put a lot of that in this jewelry. And these are big. They're about this big. And then they, um, now they made a way for the wristband that goes around your hand, the ring band that goes on the underneath, the, the ear pierced um, earring holders, all of that they order from out of the country. <coughs> and that comes. And then they're just doing the, um, the bezel, which is the um, exterior, if they have an exterior of silver going around the bead, that is a bezel and then they're placing the stones inside. So here you see row work, and I'm sure you've seen this before, and so it's just repeated, 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 and then up there is called channel work, and that's, that's basically what I have in my theory. Although the pieces of metal, silver, in between the stone is a lot wider. Isn't it beautiful? Mm -hmm. It's just beautiful, isn't it? And that's got a real Mexican influence to it. It does. Yeah, real past. Yes. And you're going to see that um, everything we've seen so far has a Mexican influence. Even the squash balls. <coughs> it, it, nothing is original. Nothing lands on the earth just out of our mind, you know. Just, but we see something either through trade or through our travels and we embed that, we grasp what we like, and then we try to reproduce it. And then the Navajo, as you know, you're, they're seeing, who are they seeing in their lives? They're seeing traders with maybe Mexican silver on, 
and then they're also seeing uh, military and the militia had um, were real avid collectors of this turquoise and metal jewelry. Whoop, whoop! Wow, dude. There's some roll, and we'll find in this one. Okay, I just brought this in so you could see the road work, the road work, and then you can see it on the nausea here. And um, also, we're going to see that this, they're going to start, in the 70s, they start placing the stones on gold. So you're going to see gold background instead of the um, silver. Here's the Zuni fetishes. And these are all carved. They used to be, in the, in the day, hand carved <coughs> all by hand. But now they send away, they get them, and they string them. But the, and originally, they um, carved all these animals, and then they pulled the, um, the beads and the, um, their long cylindrical beads through the dye, and then they would get the, the shapes cut them up and then string them. These originally were made for a ceremonial purpose. We don't think so anymore. Why? Well, Okay, so you want to know my opinion? Well, they just don't use them anymore for ceremonial yeah. purposes. And then, how do I know that just as a consumer? They're cheaper. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And if you get a cheaper piece of um, Southwest Native American jewelry, that's when you need to ask questions. Because that usually means that they order from out of the country and they're just stringing the necklace. Mm -hmm. And of course, I forgot to wear my necklace. How can you, how can you tell if that one was handmade versus, you know, handmade fetish versus one that they bought from China? Yeah. Well, um, well, you have to ask, that's when you ask a lot of questions. When was this made? Who made it? Did you make this? How did you make this? You can't tell by the weight or, or well, by the no, I'm thinking, well, I'm thinking, I'm thinking the material, well, I'm thinking the material will be lighter and it'll be um, more, um, it won't be as hand carved looking. And the commercially made stuff is very, very uniform. Don't your have hand, hand that's right. Your, that's your hand made stuff will have a lot of variation in the animals, the length of their tail, right. the shapes. I was just going to say that, and that's what I meant okay. by their lighter now. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going to zip through Hopi. Hopi, of course, is a personal favorite of mine. And so this is a good intro into Kachinas. Here's a traditional Hopi woman, um, probably the turn of the century. She has her hair wrapped around uh, two U-shaped uh, pieces of tree branch. Oh, wow. And they peel it, and it just looks like a U. They put it up here, and they wrap their hair around it, and that's what you have. You have a hair whirl. Very typical Hopi. But again, she's got the jewelry around her neck. Here's a typical Hopi man at the turn of the century. And they're the ones, again, with the short cropped hair. They don't have the braids, the Navajos have the braids. And then here is a Hopi man wearing um, coins as his jewelry, so he, they were influenced by the Mexican coin usage as well. But you can see that wrap around his head, the short cropped hair. I have a question on back to the one Hopi had earring in his ear. Uh -huh. Did that mean anything? You know, like like the Amish, you know, they you know, men, you know, are clean shaven until they get married, they have a beard. Did um, having an earring in your ear mean anything or was just I, decoration? That I couldn't tell you. Okay. I don't think it's just decoration. Okay. Now the Hopi did what's called um, overlay. And so um, what they would do is they would have the uh, silver sheet, then they would make the, um, 
the bracelet shape, and that would just, you and I, look like a solid bangle. Mm -hmm. And then they would take a lighter piece of sheet silver, cut that out with their little implements and tools. Now everything's electric. They got, you know, the, the sanders and the cutters and all that are electric. But originally, this wasn't started as electric. And they put that on top of the original strip. Then they, they would heavy solder it. And then they would go over it with a um, black oxide. And that's what, when you get the black, um, after they would cut the designs, it would sink into the designs and the, the design would stick out. And that's all. Usually, they, they didn't put, uh, and they still don't very often, put stones on their jewelry. Okay, so I brought this in to show you. This is really interesting because what is this called? You guys are pretty savvy, so you might know. Hallmarks. Hallmarks. Okay, so you want, if you're, there's a, there's a trick for you. If you're going to buy a piece of jewelry, turn it over and see if there's a Hallmark stamp there. If it is, you'll know it's, it's probably real. I don't know how else to say it. Now, the, the Hallmarks may or may not be the artist's last name, his symbol. You know, like a chop, like a Japanese chop. It may be his symbol or her symbol, or it's the symbol of the trading post. And there's books and books and books of Hallmarks now. When I first went to grad school, those hadn't even been written yet, but now people have been doing research. And there's books and books, and they can tell you exactly what trading post it came from hmm. by looking at the shape. So they stamp it in, and then that identifies it. Here you have this overlay. Isn't that pretty? And these are bolas. You know, you have the, the, the leather going around your neck, the man. And then this, this is the slider thing that goes up the center. And so they have the, the mask. And then this is the man in the maze design. And they took that from the Pima. And you see it in Pima baskets. But here we see it here. And again, it's two sheets of metal. They cut out the top, soldered it on, and then rubbed it with the black oxide. Here's the man, Charles Maloma. This to me, he's one of the, I'm totally getting personal now. He's to me one of the best of silversmiths in the Southwest. I was the first one that ever signed his work. Uh-huh. And I loved it. Yes, none of none of this was signed. But as we get into the 60s and 70s, artists are starting to sign. Or they'd stamp with a hallmark, but they wouldn't sign. Now, why would they do that? If you come back during um, Easter time, I'm going to talk about New Mexican Santos. And they weren't signed either. <coughs> but they were doing it for the sake of doing something for God. Navajos and, and Hopis and Zunis weren't like that. But they didn't see themselves as an artist on a pedestal to be worshipped. Uh, I'm giving away my prejudice. But then the trading post owner said, put your names on stuff. Fred Harvey comes in and says, I want some, some bracelets to put out so when people stop that they will buy the, the pieces and then I'll get a kickback from it. Put your name on it so they know it's you. Then um, Thomas King, same thing. Put your name on it. Then you have Lorenzo um, Hubble. Put your name on it so that you buy it for the commercial aspect of it. So you sell it for the commercial aspect of it. So there's Charles Loma. Now I'm showing you this, this picture of him because he figures very prominently in the Kachina discussion. <coughs> so just remember what he looks like. Isn't he cute? <laughs> Hopis are real tiny. They're about my size. I, I love them. They're real tiny. <laughs> And this is his jewelry. Now, he was very popular in the 70s and, and early 80s. And so here we have um, a Charles Loma. Um, and this is a Lone Mountain Spider Woman piece of turquoise right here. 
so they can identify the turquoise he's using. And a lot of his uh, bracelets were considered height bracelets, they call them. And some of these stones that he puts in, they're triangular shaped, they're this high. So you wear a cuff, and then you got stuff sticking up this high. He's considered now, um, from the 70s and 80s, he was very popular and still is. He's considered now a modernist and international um, artist. This is my last one, okay? This is just where it's gone. It's gotten really intricate. This is a squash blossom. We recognize it, we know it is, but it's on gold. Here's another one, right? Very intricate. Those are this, turtles. Beautiful. Like turtles. Don't they? And um, this is the use of Persian turquoise. <coughs> Persian turquoise, originally the Native Americans got their turquoise from Persia oh. through the trading post owners. And then they would make their, um, their jewelry from that. And, but it's lighter and it's kind of got a green tint. So sometimes if I look at this, then I can tell. <coughs> okay. Let's all stretch. <laughs> Any questions about jewelry? Yes, I have a question. Do where do you go? Where, oh, I'm, I'm going to interrupt you. So where do you go see jewelry and you get to meet the artist? Where do I go to meet Lavina. the artist? She is the one. Sandy's house. No, no. You go to <laughs> Santa Fe, <laughs> the Palace of the Governors. All the Native Americans are sitting on their, okay. under there. Okay. Now it's oriented by lottery. So you won't see the same artist there all the time. And, and you can look and talk directly to the artist. <coughs> yes. yes. Uh, my question was, do you know the uh, translation of the word Malta? What it means? I do not. I don't know. That. But to me, it was, I was always told it was a Moorish. It was derived from the Moorish. Uh, yes. And what's the and that's the Spanish Kelly. influence because the Spanish yeah. is joining. Oh, um, that begins with a C. What's it? Cla 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 yeah. Cla Cla I don't know. I should know. Yeah, Cla 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 yeah. You can Cla find that similar. exactly the same. Huh. Thank you. Okay. Kachinas. You ready? Mm -hmm. This is where the stories come in. This is where I put the thing down. Here's your, um, here's your vocabulary. Here I'm going to talk about which villain. The Hopi are located on the mesas. There's three mesas, first, second, third mesa. I went to the third mesa. Okay? And what I saw when I went there was the Puamu ceremony, which happens in February. And that's the bean sprout ceremony. And all the kachinas have been asleep all through the winter, and now they're returning. So it's called the return of the kachinas. And I'll go through that. But here's what the, uh, the mesa top looks like. Now, where is this located at? This is in northeastern Arizona. OK, the Hopi, I didn't bring that. I should have. But the Hopi are located right in the center. They're a tiny little reservation, totally surrounded by the Navajo and the northern Arizona. And so and they're a very peace-loving people. They're very small. They're very gentle. And um, so this is what I saw when I went up to Holt Villa on the third mesa. And you can see their, their buildings are made out of stone covered with the um, adobe mud brick and then you see the ladders that if they're multi-story. You also will see white around the windows because they uh, want to insulate now so they put white around the windows wood and then they put windows in. So these are the early kachinas. Okay? And my, I, my Hopi will suck but this is the pichtiu or the flat kachina dolls. This is what they give the little babies, the little kids, and they'll have painted, and they'll have the aspects 
same colors on the kachinas, and they give them to the little kids to play with. So they, they're not articulated. Everything's just on a cylinder of wood. What's the wood they use? The wood they use is um, cottonwood, cottonwood root, because just like with the New Mexican folk art, it's very lightweight and very easily carved. They have to um, more or less order it now. They have to specially order it now. You can't just go out and hack your own piece of cottonwood. Um, there's three types of kachinas before I get started too much. And I'm going to talk faster so I don't keep you too long. But there's three types of kachinas. There is the kachina cult, okay? And that C word really scares some of us. But what does the word cult mean? A group of people in the head of cult. It's just a belief system. That's all it means. Okay, so don't put any of your preconceived blah, blah. So the Kachina cult is the Kachina belief system. Okay? So you have the supernatural, the otherworldly um, deity, if you will, of the Kachina, <clears throat> which belongs to the Kachina cult. Then you have the men who only men are in, indoctrinated or initiated into the Kachina cult. And the men are the ones that dress up, impersonate, as we call it, because we're gringos, impersonate the Kachinas. They put on the helmet Kachina mask. Kachina masks go all the way around the, the head and they put it right on top. And then as soon, oh gosh, you guys, this is so cool. Because see, I make mask sculptures, and I want to do this. <laughs> as soon as they put that mask on their head, what does the man become? He's transformed into the Kachina deity. He will not speak English. They only speak their own language to each other. He is totally that being. I got chills all over. I got chills in my arms and my legs, just tell me. It, some of you are going to say, oh, I've heard of that. The Olmec and the Maya did the same thing in Mesoamerica. The emergence of the jaguar mask from the, the weird, the baby face of the Olmec. It's in all early cultures. It's so exciting. So you have the Kachina impersonator, quote unquote. You have the Kachina god, deity, quote unquote. And then you have the Kachina dolls. And you and I know the Kachina dolls. And they're carved out of wood. They're given to the kids of very young age, to boys and girls, to teach them the different aspects and different uh, types of Kachinas. When the boys get to be about 7, 10, 11 years old, they separate and they get initiated in the kiva into the um, kachina cult. The girls never get initiated. But the Hopi are matrilineal. It's totally social, political arrangement. The Hopi are matrilineal. Um, their ownership of property, their ownership of their, their herds, you know, their shepherds, their farmers, is passed through the female line. The property is passed through the female line. What are the men going to do? Just stand around, look cute? They are totally responsible for the Kachina cult and for the whole Kachina um, belief system. So that's their responsibility. The only thing the girls and the women do is maybe um, when they have the Kiva dances, which I'll talk about, is they give out Piki treats. Piki is blue corn flour and they wrap them in corn husks and give them out to the kachinas as they go in and out of the kiva. But that's it. And they will have received um, some kachina dolls, but then they start not receiving those anymore. And I'll go through that whole receiving thing. Becky, when they're initiated, do they get to pick what their kachina is? Uh, no. Actually, when you're initiated, I believe that you adopt the same kachina as your father, grandfather, 
Okay. So here's, um, so again, these are given to very young Hopi. Here's some more that are um, given to very young Hopi. And then some more. And you can see the original paint was vegetable, vegetable and um, mineral. And so that paint here, they've started using the military influenced oil based paint. And you can see how it bleeds into the, <coughs> the white of the other. Uh, Forms. Now you're going to start seeing articulation. What does that mean? Separation of legs and arms from the body. But it's still very simple. Still from a, a <coughs> still a cylinder piece of wood. Here we see one. I just put this in because it's. I can look at it. And you can look at it. You go. Oh man, that is so old. Look at. He's got articulated arms, but they're tied with string to the top of his body. It's just, it's just cool. And now we're getting into um, a later period. You see the legs and the costume and the arms are fully formed. They're still relatively close to the body, but these are whipper kachinas. Whipper kachinas are great. Whipper kachinas, when they have plaza dances, and you go in with a baseball cap on or sunglasses, or you're sitting on one of their walls, or you're sitting down even, or you have your back turned, you know, you're, you're um, doing your phone, the whipper kachina will come up with a yucca whip and just go tch. <laughs> yeah, that's what it will get, go tch. They just tch. When you're initiated as a boy, you get four whippings by the yucca down in the kiva. But it's just tch, you know, tch. Yeah, so this is a whipper kachina. And I saw it done. Because people were blah, 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 when we went to the Puang ceremony and we were looking at the plaza dances. And so I saw them come over and just go, and just knock it off. OK. Now, I brought these in just so you can see. Um, when I talk about the plaza dances, this is the way the kachina, uh, the, the, um, the males were, are dressed. They were dressed as women for the plaza dances because they were doing the basket dance. So they all came out as women and they had their, their wrap around, female wrap of the white on the bottom. They had the helmet mask of the female with the hair whorls <coughs> stuck onto the side. It was absolutely a riot. And they're dancing around, trying to impersonate women, you know, and dancing around, doing the basket, have baskets, and they were doing a wig and stuff like that. I just cracked up laughing. <laughs> okay, here you can see a little bit more um, use of the feathers, and then a little bit more articulation. And then we, we come to Alvin James Machia. And he's very famous. And these are his. We've gotten fully articulated. His kachinas look very, very real. And so we have a, um, these are buffalo dancers. And the arms are articulated. They're away from the body. The, the body has, oh, see, if you, if, you, if you come to a European, Western European art history lecture, I'll tell you about Conto Posto. But it's weight change, weight stance. So you see that even being used here. Very realistic. Oops. Oops. Oh, shit, I didn't mean to do this. Okay, here's a wolf kachina. Look at what he's doing now. You remember those early ones? The, they were the 1880s, 1890s. They were just like this, right? Maybe they have one foot forward. Look at it now. After the 60s, they're bent. They have one knee down, one knee up, and this is the wolf kitchen. It's like a real person. Okay, so then we get into fads. Fads are interesting because, you know, just like um, other things, they're very interesting. The fads, one of the fads was, let's make it as big as we can, four and five foot tall kachinas. And you'll see that at the Kachina Inn in Santa Fe, or Taos. The, the kachinas are huge. It was a fad. What are they doing it for? The white. Oh. 
So here he is, eagle dancers. These are all eagle dancers, but look at him. And they, um, they aren't allowed to mine the feathers anymore because the birds are, are restricted and endangered. So you will see these feathers carved out of wood now. It's pretty impressive. I put this in because it look, it's just called a dance set, and you might see this in a gallery. There was a gallery in Colorado Springs. I looked up, and there was a dance set of mud heads along the line going towards the Kiva to either do a Kiva dance, but they were dolls. They were Kachina dolls carved out of wood. And so you see a series. And this is the way it looks with the Kachinas coming in. Now those? Dolls are those people dressed. These are dolls. Dolls. Okay. Okay. Now, um, trying to think of what I have here. Okay. So this is. Um, I worked at the Herb Museum as a curator, assistant curator. That's in Arizona. And this is the way they stored their kachinas. So I just show it to you because wow, we. You know these kachinas now. You know how much they cost now. Maybe $1,200. Yeah. But look at all. And he got these when they very first were made. Probably $1.98. No, definitely. <laughs> definitely, don't you think? And this is the way they store them. So I took these pictures because I thought, oh, this is just cool. And after a while, you'll be able to just open this, and you'll see they're all wearing black um, headdresses or white headdresses. But oh, that's buffalo dancers, you know? See here, some. They, we put all the same kind next to each other. And then here you have um, one, and you see how they're tied to a metal pole so that they don't fall over. This is an older one. And here is a Machia, you can tell. He's a buffalo dancer. Can I ask how you authenticate, again, a Kachina? Do you do like a the age of the wood? I mean, how do you do yes, it? Yes, and you can look at it and, and um, oh, so I have to tell a real quick story. I know I'm, I'm getting wrong because I haven't even done my kachina ceremony yet. <laughs> but um, this, this student came in I said, bring in your pieces of art. You know, I said, I'm getting really good at Antiques Roadshow, Becky's Roadshow. I said, I'm pretty good at, at um, giving you an estimate of, you know, its value. So this couple, they, they were very young, this young guy was just cuter than it. But, you know, I taught college, so he was like, what, 22 or something. And he comes in, and he brings in this vase. <clears throat> and he says, we got this for a wedding. And I tried not to let my face do anything. But I could tell it was made out of what? Plastic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's how you tell. That's how you tell. You look at the workmanship, and if it's faded like that, it won't be cheap. And then you can maybe get a, what's called a provenance or a history on the piece. But you'll be able to tell. It'll look cheap. And now the um, Kachina dolls, um, first they were vegetable and mineral pigments, then they went to watercolors and oils, and now they're primarily painted in acrylics. So just like this. It'll be clean, it'll be really nicely painted. You, you can tell. Thank you. Mm -hmm. A lot of them don't sign, and they don't have a place to sign. Sometimes they'll sign if they're on a base. Here's another, um, look how realistic this is. This is an Alvin James Macchiato, look at that. You can see the teeth, the mustache, you can see the teeth inside the mouth. Is that all carved out of one piece of wood? Uh, it's all carved out. Well, a lot of times the arms are articulated <coughs> and they're added, the arms and legs, so that you can go like this. They're dolls, so you can play with them. Wow. Here's, here's another one. The rough originally came from dog. Now they, um, um, mail away for mink, and so they set, they send them mink now and they put it on. That's a pretty new one, right? That's oh, pretty new. All these are pretty new. Here's the sun kachina. That's pretty obvious. 
Mm. Clown Pacino. Oh, at the end of the plaza dance, the clowns come out with the mud heads. I don't have a picture of a mud head, but they're all brown. They're just brown from head to toe. But the clown Pacinos come out, and they, you know, you're all standing around in a half moon circle around the plaza dance, and they throw you candy. And they do somersaults and handstands and stuff. They're great. Okay, now, do we have time to do the ceremony? Yes, sir. You'll really like this, because yes. it's totally active. Yes, do. Okay, this is the Sophie ceremonial calendar. You have it on the back of your, your sheet. And um, this is one way of spelling Kachina. Another way is with the CH. If I look at this, I realize that's, that's written probably in the 30s or 40s, but of, of 1930s or 40s. But um, actually, the, the ceremonial calendar has not changed that much. I went to the Puamu ceremony right here, and um, it's the bean dance. And so I'll, I'll describe that. It's in February. So here's the Puamu bean dance ceremony. Here's the crow mother. I'm going to talk about her so you'll recognize her and her attendants. And these are the great, the chief kachinas of the Puanu ceremony. Every ceremony has a chief kachina. So I just brought these dolls in to show you. Um, one of the chief kachinas of the Puanu ceremony is um, <coughs> this one. This one right here. And you see the triangle of the crow mother in the face, but around it, it's painted yellow with little crosses. And that's the Aho Ahola, and then the Ahola Mana is next to it. Oh, oh. So, okay, so, okay, so, let's do it, so, okay, so, so. I'm, an, I'm a grad school and I'm going to ASU and so we all get in our car and this Hopi has invited us to see the Kiva dances for the Puamu ceremony. Am I supposed to see the Kiva dances of the Puamu ceremony? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No. No. So, <coughs> but, but it's his Kiva. He says, my Kiva and I want you to come. And we say, okay, well if you say it's okay, okay. So we go and um, we drive up of course at night and we're driving up on top, and then somebody says, I think you're driving over a Kiva. You know, in the truck. Right? In the van. So, back on. There's no lights, no headlights, no, no street lights, nothing. And then we go around, and, and the guy goes, There's my um, Pueblo right over there, the Hopi Legal Pueblos. So we go around the the corner and we park our truck there and unload. And we go in and go to Villa, the third mesa, and it's the oldest Pueblo built at Hope that whole Villa. And we're there. It's like from the 1600s, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm just so tickled. I'm just <coughs> I'm like, you realize what? and they're all everybody's like, <sighs> you know, they're so tired. We've been driving all day. So we get in and we sleep on the floor. You look up, it's all got the latillas, yeah. I have to do the architecture. That has the, the wood poles of the ceiling and, and it has the adobe of the walls. And so we all go in and we uh, get our sleeping bags out and lay on the floor and go to sleep. But very interesting, they had a porta potty in the corner <laughs> with, with, a, with a shower curtain. You could pull the shower curtain and it's oh one of those chairs with the buckets, <laughs> with the bags, the plastic <laughs> bag blow up. And so, you know, they had a potty. Otherwise, you'd have to haul butt, walk through the plaza, go down around the corner, down, 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 to go to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it was just, I was just, I had never seen anything like this. So we get in there, we sleep, and then, th then it starts. And our guy tells us, okay, I want you guys, this is my, this is my Pueblo, and it's just one room. A little room, and he says, I want you to be totally quiet. 
don't make any noise, don't talk, don't laugh, don't do anything. And so I'm sitting there, and it's dark, and it's black, and I don't hear anything. And I hear this voice in my head, and it's That's the Kachinas returning. They're coming. And I'm just going ballistic. I got chills right now. They're coming. They're running through the village. They're coming, running up and down the, the pathways. I hear. They're running all around. And I'm like, oh. everybody's I'm like, oh my gosh, you need to wake up. This is fantastic. <laughs> And then he comes in, the guy who owns it, he goes and comes in and he says, okay everybody, here we go. So we stand up, he says, be absolutely quiet. And he files us all to the kiva. The kiva is a it, it, prehistoric, it was semi-subterranean round pit. Not anymore, not with the Hopi. They're above ground and um, so you probably would think it was just someone's home or something. But your clue is there's a ladder sticking out the top, then you know it's a key. Mm -hmm. So his key was right next to his pipe, and he goes, so we walk in, and then we open, and then we go into the kiva. Oh! We get in there, and there's this um, uh, altar area, so I, I don't know what else to call it, with a seat in adobe all the way around, a bench. And so he says, go sit there. And we're like, no, no, we'll stay back here in the dark. He goes, no, go sit there. And I'm like, so we go and sit on the bench. Right there, right where you're sitting, right there is a man, a, a Hopi man. I think he's like 98 years old. He's all skinny. He only has a little tiny breech cloth on. And he's the keeper of the fire. So he keeps the fire and the smoke goes up the stairs of the ladder. That's where the ladder goes, out to the, out the top of the kiva. So we're just like this. Because we know that it's going to be the Atnyoli. That is when the return the, ki, the kachinas and they come down into each kachi, kiva. And there must have been, they, he said there were 10 or 12 kivas. And they go down and they dance. And then they leave. And the next kiva group comes down, does their dance, leaves, goes to the next kiva, another kiva group comes. Each kiva has its own group of dancers. Now they're going up and down the ladder. They're going up and down the ladder. So cool. So Becky's got her seat right at the bottom of the ladder. And the old man's right there. And I'm trying to be really unobtrusive in my white gringo kind of way. And so I hear I hear um, I hear this, and so I don't know Hopi, so I can't translate. But so all I heard was sound, and then I hear the old man go, uh 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 uh, and then the other one goes, uh uh uh. And then one at the top goes, ooh, 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 ooh. And I'm like, what is going on? And I'm cracking up, you know? And so these men and boys come down the ladder one at a time, dressed as what? Women. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> and and the boys have all these wigs on and they're people giggling. And, and the men all come down, you know, they got their fake, you know, sisters on and stuff. And they're just, and they do their repeat dance. They do a repeat dance. They call it a repeat dance when they just go in a circle and they repeat the same thing. And they went around and around and laughing, laughing, everybody's laughing. And then they leave. Then, this goes on for, for several other groups, okay? Then, all of a sudden, I hear, da -da -da, and the guy at the bottom goes, okay, you know, and it's these older men 
and they come down, there were six of them, only six. We had had 15 to 20 sometimes, but this was only six of them. And they're big, and they don't have a shirt on. They just have the breech, um, the, the little kilt on, the hokey kilt. And they come down, and they got you know some jewelry on, they got the rattle in their hand, and there's only six of them. Going like this. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, they, their bodies went right this close to me. Charles Paul. Mm -hmm. And I almost went, oh, <laughs> I didn't. I was being really good. He was one of them. They all looked like they all had gray white hair cut off down to here with the straight bangs, no shirt on, kilt, and little um, moccasins. And they did a repeat dance with shaking and rattle. And, when, and so he went back and forth, around back. Can I have your hand? No, I didn't do that. And, and so he's going around, going around, and then they leave. And I'm like, oh, I've seen God. You know, and because I knew him from working at the Herd Museum, because I had seen him at a reception, so I knew who he was. And so he comes down, and I was like, I can't. Six or eight of those dances, it took us to like three or four in the morning. Oh, mm -hmm. gosh. So I'm just like, like this, right? And as the kachinas leave, the girls give out the little peaky treats. So they give us some peaky treats, too. And we try them. They're mixed with, mm, my favorite, I guess, lard, <laughs> right? Because they tasted so good. <laughs> They're kind of sweet. They're really good. And... Um, and then we wait, we get out of the kiva. Well, okay, so, 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 I'm, I'm gonna tell you, tell you this because you'll love this. So, I, I get up, we're all standing up, and I'm, I'm just standing there watching everybody, you know, like, well, I wonder what they're gonna do now. I guess it's the end, I wonder what's gonna happen. And I turn around, and there's all the men impersonators, they open the lid of this altar thing, they're all taking off their clothes and their helmet masks and putting them in there. And then the, the little old guy is dancing a, and singing up a storm, <coughs> like, save us from all these white gringos, you know, that came along. And I was like, so then we wait, 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 and then at dawn, here comes Crow Mother out of the, the kiva. Mm -hmm. She comes out of the kiva, is stone deaf silent, and she's holding a platter in her hand, and the platter has the forest grown bean sprouts in it. And so um, each woman of the tribe goes up, has her shawl over her head, goes up, takes a bean sprout, bows, and then leaves. And so that all the women of the tribe do that with this one crow mother. And she's just leaving real slow. And it is a woman, or is it a man? I, I don't know. It's, it, they make a sound that is not of this earth. <laughs> I'm serious. They, they sound like <clears throat> I can't make it. It's, it's not you or I. It's not human. So she's gone. And I was like, well, the whipper kachinas are going around because they're paying attention. They're trying to make sure you're not, you know, wearing a baseball cap or whatever. You know. And I was like, this is all so new to me. I was like, a flabbergasted. Then, I'm going to end this real quick. So then, the guy goes, okay, that's it. Crow Mother went through. And this, this um, afternoon, we're going to go to lunch at my aunt's house, which was right down the, the plaza. And it was in a, a cinder block of government built house, right down the plaza, guess what we had to eat for lunch? Beans. Bean sprout soup. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, man. And it's supposed to signal the beginning of the harvest. Because they just planted the bean sprouts, they just planted the crops. And so this is all good, good stuff. And then, then after that was the plaza dances. And that's what you guys can all go see. And the different dancers from the Kivas come in and they just, they did the basket dance, they did 
some other dance, and then they throw candy. It's kind of like a palette. But that was really cool. Wow. And then I look up on the, on the kiva, on the rim of it, on the top, I see the rows of kids all lined up, ready to go down the ladder to the initiation. And so that's when they do it, is during the form, is the initiation. Wow, that was great. Yeah, that was a great description. Ta-da! <laughs> I, I neglected to say that Becky is an artist, too, and that she has her work at the Space Gallery mm -hmm. from time to time. So when you're in the Space Gallery, be sure to look for Becky Miller. And, and, and at the Habita yeah. Gallery on me. Yeah. 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 No, I'm a painter. Yeah. Yeah. She makes masks, too. I do yeah. ceramic masks. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. I hope that was good. I get so excited to learn about that. Oh, that's so cool. I couldn't tell. Oh, I just love that. Let me know if you have questions. Also, let me know if you're interested in coming back around Easter to talk about Our Lady of Guadalupe.